Dear friends and members of our beloved community, we extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to each of you as we gather on this special day to celebrate Indigenous Day of Prayer. In our worship today, we come together to honor and appreciate the rich heritage, wisdom, and spirituality of the Indigenous peoples who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial, and to learn more about some of the decisions facing our church as we live together towards right relations. In this sacred space, we are called to open our hearts and minds, to listen with compassion, and to learn from the teachings of our Indigenous siblings. Whether you have come seeking solace, inspiration, or community, we invite you to be present in this moment, to connect with the Great Spirit and with one another, and to embrace the spirit of unity and love. No matter where you are on your spiritual journey, know that you are welcome here. Together, let us celebrate the beauty of diversity, the strength of resilience, and the power of unity as we worship the Creator, the Great Spirit, who weaves us all into a tapestry of love and grace. We begin our worship today with an invitation to observe Indigenous Peoples Day from, on June 21st from our moderator, the Right Reverend Dr. Cameron Lounsdown. Greetings. I'm the Right Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne, moderator of the United Church of Canada. June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day, a day to recognize the unique heritage and diverse cultures of Indigenous peoples across the country from coast to coast to coast. While on Truth and Reconciliation Day in September, we recognize and commemorate the challenges and realities of our colonized and colonizing history in Canada, National Indigenous Peoples Day is a time of celebration to recognize and lift up the resilience of Indigenous people and communities and to celebrate what we have to share with the rest of the country. This year, I was invited to attend the National Inspire Awards where I learned about so many inspiring Indigenous leaders who work and lead in many different sectors across the country. That's one way I celebrated early this year. There are a number of things that you can do to celebrate or recognize this day. Attend a local celebration or cultural event. Plan to attend with family, friends, or colleagues. Spend the day exploring the Indigenous heritage of the place where you work or live. Learn to introduce yourself in the Indigenous language or languages from where you live or work. Add to the Indigenous economy Support Indigenous businesses by shopping or dining in Indigenous-owned stores and restaurants. Actually, you should do this one year-round. Support Indigenous programs through our Gifts with Vision partnerships. You can learn more at giftswithvision.ca. Listen to Indigenous music. Visit an art gallery or museum with a show curated by Indigenous peoples. Read a book, fiction, nonfiction, or poetry by an Indigenous author. Watch a movie or TV show featuring Indigenous direction, screenwriting, and acting. Take time to share with others what National Indigenous Peoples Day is and how they can join you in the celebration. I know that many communities of faith have Reconciliation Matters Committees, which is a great place to build community and discuss the ways in which you engaged with Indigenous culture this National Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Wallace So Indigenous Peoples Day is one of the things coming up this week. Some other things that are coming up, joint M&P meeting in Atwood on Tuesday at 7, our regular quilting in Atwood and coffee here at Trinity on Wednesday, and then Wednesday morning, and then Wednesday afternoon is the 85th plus birthday party here at 2 p.m., so that will be a great celebration. And then Sunday, we have a special service planned. It is our farming Sunday. And so we are going to meet outside on the lawn behind Atwood Church. There's actually a very big lawn back there. Uh, bring a lawn chair. Um, dress for farming or gardening, because that's way better for being outside anyhow. If you have a tractor, whether it's a toy tractor or a lawn tractor or a real full-size tractor, feel free to bring your tractor to church. Um, our theme is farming and seeds and our relationship to agriculture. There will be a potluck lunch following that service. Um, We'll probably have the food inside, but you can eat inside or outside depending on the weather. It, weather location is inside at Atwood United Church. It's at 10 a.m. next Sunday. There is no service here next Sunday. 
And then we move into our summer schedule. And so all of our services are at 10 a.m. throughout the summer. In July, we will be here at Trinity at 10 a.m. And in August, we will be in Atwood at 10 a.m. Also, an upcoming opportunity is Vacation Bible School. We're going to have two activity days this year, one in July and one in August. Registration is now open for those, so please, if you've got kids, grandkids, um, please encourage them. The, it, your announcement insert has the address to register. Please encourage them to sign up for that now. Also, we're looking for stuff for a something from nothing challenge. Next week would be a perfect opportunity to bring it because it would already be at Atwood United Church and save me having to transport it. So if you've got, you know, miscellaneous things, the kids are gonna be challenged to make something that floats. So have you got styrofoam? Have you got wood? Have you got yogurt containers? Have you got whatever, roof tiles? As long as it's something you'd let a five-year-old play with, uh, bring it, the weirder, and more strange, in fact, the better, because we're gonna give them a bag of stuff and say, make something from this, with duct tape and other things to hold it together. So if you have some interesting things sort of sitting around in your shed or in your kitchen or wherever, um, we would love to have them for the something from nothing challenge. Are there other announcements this morning? Then let us acknowledge the territory on which we gather. This morning we acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples, part of Treaty 29. We are mindful of the rich culture, history, and spirituality of the indigenous peoples who inhabited and cared for this land for generations, long before the first settlers arrived here. We gather in deep gratitude for their past and ongoing hospitality as we continue to live together on this land. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples in the shaping and strengthening of this region, the provinces, and Canada as a whole. We commit as a community of faith to continue to work to build relationships that are just and equitable for all. And as we gather, we light a candle. O great spirit, creator of all light and life, as we gather in this sacred space to celebrate the indigenous day of prayer, we now light the Christ candle as a symbol of your divine presence among us. We remember the words of Christ, the light of the world, who calls us to be beacons of hope, healing, and reconciliation. Let us sing as we gather. <laughs> presence of Creator, we gather this day in a spirit of gratitude. Gratitude for all the gifts of creation, the air, the water, the land, the change of seasons as we move into summer. Gratitude for all the creatures that walk, swim, fly, and crawl on this earth. We gather seeking wisdom to help us to live a generous and compassionate life. We gather seeking wisdom to help us to live with respect and humility. We gather seeking hearts and minds that are open to new possibilities and new beginnings. And I am terrible about direction, so I need somebody to tell me which way is east from here. East, okay. And south? Okay. So, 
If you would please rise, if you're able, we are going to start, we'll start forward, and then we're going to move to the east, south, west, north. The response is, we seek to take the path of love. Let us, because playing in the, praying in the four directions is quite common in the indigenous, in many indigenous cultures. So creator, we give thanks for the knowledge you give to us through all the traditions of the world. Help us to honor the gifts that each tradition offers. And we turn to the east. We seek to take the path of love. We give thanks for the east, for the sun that rises to begin each new day. We give thanks for new life, for youth. We give thanks for new learning and new experiences. We seek to take the path of love. Facing the south. We give thanks for the south, for the growth of the summertime in our lives, for the teachings to be kind to ourselves and others. Help us who are elders love and respect children and youth. Help us to care for the elderly and those who cannot care for themselves. We seek to take the path of love. And turning to the West, we give thanks for the West, for the understanding of how to care for the earth. Creator, help us to use this understanding to bring joy and new life to the world. We seek to take the path of love. And facing the North, we give thanks for the North. Help us to receive gifts of wisdom and new perspectives from all peoples. Help us to grow our roots of compassion deeper as we journey. Together, we will take the path of love for ourselves and for each other. Amen. And we'll stay standing to sing. standing to read the 1982 apology from the United Church of Canada to Indigenous peoples. In the words of the then moderator, long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here, and you received from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us all that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision in our zeal to tell you of the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. We confuse Western ways and cultures with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, we helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. As a result, you and we are poor, and the image of the Creator in us is twisted and blurred, and we are not what we are meant to be by God. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the Spirit of Christ, that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed. 
Let us sing of healing. Since there are no children to help with my storytelling today, you will all have to help. What color is a crow? Who's seen a crow? And what kind of noise does a crow make? <laughs> okay. Crow, crows are kind of loud birds, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Well, Rainbow Crow is an indigenous legend about that says that once upon a time, the crow had rainbow colored feathers. It was a beautiful and colorful bird that lived in a time when the world was always warm and bright. Who would like it if the world only had summer? Oh, no one here. We, we were very mixed in Atwood. Some people were like, yes, summer all year long, that would be lovely. And other people were like, mm, no, I kind of like having four seasons. Okay, but sounds like we're a four seasons crowd here. Well. One day, winter arrived, bringing snow and cold with it. And the animals in the forest were suffering because they were used to a world where it was always warm and bright. So they decided to send a messenger to the Great Spirit to ask for help. And the animals chose the Rainbow Crow because of its beautiful feathers and its sweet voice. So Rainbow Crow set off on a long journey to the Great Spirit. It pleaded for help explaining how the animals are suffering because of the cold. The Great Spirit listens and gives Rainbow Crow a stick with fire on the end of it. Rainbow Crow thanks the Great Spirit and prepares to return to the forest. But as Rainbow Crow flies back, the heat from the stick causes its beautiful feathers to turn black, and its sweet voice becomes hoarse from the smoke. Despite these changes, Rainbow Crow completes its journey and brings fire to the animals, saving them from the cold. The animals are grateful for Rainbow Crow's sacrifice, and they learn the importance of selflessness, courage, and helping one another. May this story inspire us. Please pray with me in the words of our prayer of illumination. God of wisdom, strange and surprising, come and move us. Enliven our faith, stir our spirits, stretch our minds and the capacity of our hearts. Let your word renew our hope and lead us on paths of justice and truth. Amen. We have two scripture readings today. The first from the Hebrew scriptures is found in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 12. God appeared to Solomon at Gibeon in a dream at night. God said, ask whatever you wish and I will give it to you. Solomon responded, you showed so much kindness to your servant, my father David, when he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and with a heart true to you. You've kept to this great loyalty and kindness to him and have now given him a son to sit on his throne. And now, my God, you have made me your servant 
king in my father David's place. But I'm young and unexperienced. I know next to nothing. But I'm here, your servant, in the middle of your people you have chosen, a large population that can't be numbered or counted due to its vast size. Please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. It pleased God that Solomon had made this request. God said to him, because you have asked for this instead of requesting a long life, wealth, or victory over your enemies, asking for discernment so as to acquire good, not, good judgment, I will now do just what you have said. Look, I hereby give you a wise and understanding mind. There has been no one like you before now, and now, nor will there be anyone like you afterward. And then reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 to 22. A man approached Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. The man said, Which ones? Then Jesus said, don't commit murder, don't, ad don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man replied, I've kept all these. What am I still missing? Jesus said, if you want to be complete, go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away saddened because he had many possessions. And then a contemporary indigenous reading by Richard Wagamese called My Spirituality Is. My spirituality is me seeking to be turned to the great mystery that surrounds me. It is me seeking to be opened, to be joined to it, so that it becomes a part of me and I, in turn, become a part of it. It is me seeking to honor the truth of the things that lie beneath the surface of myself, of you, of creator, of creation, committing to those truths and working towards never allowing them to be made invisible to me again. It is me on the shore of the great ocean of truth, always seeking a prettier shell or a smoother stone. May God bless to us these readings. Let's sing together number 143 and more voices. We cannot own the sunlit sky.
Life is filled with moments of transition, endings and new beginnings. Whether it's a new home or a new relationship or a new phase of life, a new job or a new grade in school or a new friendship, my guess is that all of us experience something new happening in our lives from time to time. Some of us are likely experiencing newness right now. And often these new beginnings are filled with joy and excitement. We happily anticipate what will unfold. New beginnings can be hopeful times, times when we feel most fully alive with possibility. But new beginnings can also be daunting and hard. Often a new beginning requires an ending to move to a new home, you must leave your current one. To start a new job, you must leave your current one. To move into a new grade in school it means leaving behind the current teacher in class. So along with the joy of trying something new, there is the sadness of letting go of something that has been. Even when we desperately want the new thing that is happening in our lives, it can sometimes be really hard and the challenge of change when we're anticipating something and grief hits us can be hard. New beginnings can also make us feel vulnerable. There's lots of uncertainty and anxiety when we're starting something new. How is this gonna work out? Will they like me? Can I do it? Will it actually turn out like I hope it will once I actually get started? And so much more. New beginnings are not always easy, even if they are new beginnings that we long for. Often they come with mixed emotions. And so it is with our readings this morning. Our gospel reading from Matthew is about a young man who comes to Jesus seeking the answer to how we might have a perfect or eternal life. And Jesus' instructions to him are clear. Go and sell your possessions, give your money to those who are poor, and then come follow me. In other words, to build a new life, this young man must give up what is familiar and comforting to him. He must be willing to risk everything. I suspect that Jesus' answer unsettles him. This new path means letting go of the young man's current identity and wealth. The reading tells us that he walked away from Jesus grieving, for he had many possessions. For him, the lure of a new life even one he most certainly wanted, or why would he have come to Jesus with this question in the first place, was not enough compensation for the sacrifices he would have to make. So he goes away dis disappointed. And then there is Solomon in our reading from 1 Kings. At a very young age, he finds himself in a leadership role as the new king. He's quite anxious about how he's going to follow in the footsteps of his famous father, King David. One night he has a dream where he meets up with God and God gives him the opportunity to ask for anything. He asks God for wisdom and understanding. He is seeking wisdom because he wants to be a good leader and make the best possible decisions for the people he is leading. This request pleases God. Perhaps Solomon and this young man might serve as metaphors for us at this time in our own history and story as the United Church of Canada. It is indeed a time of change, of endings and new beginnings in the life of the church. Over the past few months, we've talked about many of those changes and challenges, and we will continue to do so in the weeks and months ahead. One of the most effective ways to navigate change in community is to talk about it. It is those losses that we don't acknowledge, the changes we fear, the signs of the times that we ignore, that can fester most easily and cause pain in the body of Christ. Today we want to fo focus on some changes that are being proposed by the, by the National Church to help us live into our commitment to move or it's moving towards right relation with Indigenous peoples and overcoming the historic and still active patterns of injustice in our society with respect to First Peoples. In particular, we are going to talk a little bit about a change that the National Indigenous Organization within the United Church of Canada is asking for, that our governing bodies will make a vote on in the fall. 
through a process called a remit. So here's a bit of background. In 2022, the 44th General Council of the United Church of Canada gathered. At that gathering, the National Indigenous Council proposed that the church identify and remove any structural barriers that would prevent developing and sustaining an autonomous national Indigenous organization within the United Church of Canada. Currently, the National Indigenous Organization has responsibilities and roles equivalent to a regional council, like our regional council, Western Ontario Waterways, commonly known as WOW, which met a few weeks ago. This would allow the Indigenous Church full powers to shape their own structure and governance as they see fit with complete autonomy. Because this is a significant change to how we have been structured as a national church, it requires a process called a remit. When our ancestors got together and founded the basis of union to agree to be together as the United Church of Canada, they said, if you're going to change this, you have to ask the church again. And remits come as in two levels of significance. For minor changes, only a majority of regional councils must agree. But for major changes like this one, a majority of regional councils and a majority of local communities of faith must both approve. And because a remit requires an absolute majority of communities of faith and regional councils, regardless of how many submit a vote, not voting is the equivalent of a no vote. So I am highly invested in our governing bodies casting their votes. We don't want to say to the Indigenous Church, we don't even care enough to be bothered voting. And if this remit passes, here's what it will do. It will enable the Indigenous Church to determine its place and structure within the United Church. And it will enable the creation of an autonomous national Indigenous organization within the United Church of Canada. When we look back on our history, both as a nation and as the United Church of Canada, settlers have generally taken upon it upon them ourselves to decide things for Indigenous peoples. We decided what land they could live on, creating reservations, and then sometimes we changed our minds and made them move, usually to less good land when we wanted the land we had originally given them. We told them where they had to send their kids to school and didn't let them remove their children from those schools when they were being abused or mistreated. Indigenous parents had no say in their children's education and could not even take them out of school if their kids told them about physical or sexual abuse that they were experiencing. Imagine how devastating that must have felt for them as parents. I know most of you are parents, and so I'm sure you can imagine how you would feel if you had absolutely no say in the education of your children. And when the United Church of Canada was formed in 1925, most Indigenous congregations were considered to be missions, not congregations, and so they were also not entitled to vote on church union. This remit seeks to change that pattern. Indigenous peoples in the United Church are asking for the right to decide for themselves how they structure their decision-making and other activities. It's about giving up control and trusting Indigenous peoples to know what is best for themselves and to decide accordingly. One of the sneaky things that colonialism does to our thinking is to create a kind of paternalism where we believe that we have the answers to questions that aren't really about us. Often there is even a kind of benevolence in intention, like a parent caring for a young child. But this is deeply harmful since it's not small children in need of protection that we're talking about. We're talking about adults, including cultural elders who are the experts on their own reality. How would you like it if someone else decided that you didn't know anything about what you were doing and they started making decisions for you? So this is our chance to practice what we've been saying and allow the Indigenous Church to decide for themselves. It's an act of trust that acknowledges to Indigenous peoples that you are the experts on what is best for you. And it challenges the history of colonialism in an important way. It honors what we have said in our 1986 apology by challenging us to stop equating Western culture with the gospel and to truly allow for other ways of living out the faith. Just because we do it differently doesn't mean we're not following Christ. 
It is also in keeping with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, sometimes called UNDRIP for short, and the calls to the church that the caretakers of the Indigenous Church offer to the United Church, expressing to us this. The desire to live in right relations with a repentant church and pursue the original indigenous desire for friendship, peace, and the strength that comes from respect. Like the young man in the story from Matthew, this remit and the unfolding changes in our church's relationship with indigenous peoples offer all sorts of new possibilities and opportunities. They also come with uncertainty and lots of questions. In this, as in so much facing the church and the world today, we don't know what comes next. But I believe that if we accept this invitation to trust in new life, that something great could happen. If we walk away, then we're gonna find ourselves stuck repeating patterns that we know are not inspiring new life and vitality in our churches. Like Solomon, we need to seek wisdom and understanding. Maybe this is a holy moment for us a time for us to contemplate and invite renewal, not only for the Indigenous Church, but for us as well. Maybe this is a time for us to trust that there will be uncertainty, but collectively we can forge a new future. We came to claim to be a church with a commitment to seek justice. Perhaps this is an invitation to live into that commitment. As the caretakers of the Indigenous Church wrote in Calls to the Church, our own indigenous understanding of the Christ story is what we need. We are indigenous nations, tribes, confederacies with clans and elders. Creator has placed us in our sacred lands and taught us to harvest the food, just as the first humans in the Bible. Our ways of seeing and being in this earth are much like the Hebrew people. We can hear creation and have learned from all relations, the animals, the water folk, the plant families, our mother, the earth. We hear in the groaning of the earth the sufferings of Christ. We feel the preciousness of life and the sanctity of love in our communities and lands. Part of our work will challenge the colonial vision of Jesus and Western theology. Our indigenous languages, ways of life, spiritualities, and connection to our traditional lands will be restored. We are finding our own spirituality and indigenous understandings of Jesus and his work in our communities. We will see through our eyes who Jesus is and decide for ourselves what this means for us as ministries and communities of faith. We are thankful for our roots in the work of the church in our past, but we will shape our future through our own perspectives. The Spirit gives us authority to do this, and we will listen to our siblings in the larger community of faith. May it be so. Amen. And let's sing together, Let There Be Light. And this one is in Voices United 679. And our minute for mission today is a video, so let's watch together. Mm -hmm. 
Your gifts through mission and service enable the church to continue to live into our commitments to healing and reconciliation. Today I'm chatting with Murray Pruden, National Executive Minister for Indigenous Ministries and Justice, to discuss the journey and the path forward. Murray, I'm really glad you're here today. Uh, pleasure to be here. I wondered if you might be able to tell us a little bit about the Healing Fund and perhaps a story about the impact of that fund. The Healing Fund program, which is coordinated by one of my staff members in, in our unit, is quite significant for our Indigenous communities in this path, as, as the title says, for healing. Last year in November, we supported a theatre project, a theatre group, Bunk 7, and it was a story based on residential schools local members were in residential school in Edmonton. And so this is part of their story and their uprising uh, against the residential school systems as, as children. And uh, to see it being played out by their local community members, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous in, in the roles and actual youth uh, playing the roles of the young boys, it was just remarkable, but just uplifting to see that we can support our communities in this way, that we're able to share these stories. And this is this is the gift of healing creatively. Mm -hmm. If we don't share these stories, we don't heal as well. If we can create more of these programs where we have, you know, this proper, you know, partnerships and relationship building and dialogue amongst our youth, they are the ones who are going to tell us what the needs of the church are for the for generations to come. I'm reminded of a, I think it was a mission and service funded uh, activity where youth, as you said, uh, were reclaiming their language through superhero videos. And yep, yep. Do, you, do you remember that project? Or? I do, I do. And I, yeah. I'm very, uh, I was happy to see that. And, you know, I hope to see more of those types of programs come up as well. We also yeah. helped and supported a very elongated project uh, with the, with the Mohawk Nation, uh, with the, with the, with the Mohawk language Bible. We want to be as good as a relation and neighbor to, to all those that are willing to, to walk with us. Your gifts for mission and service will help support important programs for healing, learning, and teaching. As human beings walking on this sacred earth, we hear again the call to generous living. Let us receive the earth's gifts gratefully. Let us share the earth's gifts freely so that together we might enjoy abundant life in partnership with all creation. May the work of our congregation foster wholeness, care for creation, and embody the love of God always. Let us sing thanks to God for the gift shared. Please join me in our offering prayer. Holy and gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us and the gifts we bring, so that we might do deeds of love in your name and for your sake. Amen. Let us continue in prayer together. Creator, quiet our hearts. Still our busy minds so that we may know your voice. This morning we give thanks for the blessings of summer, warmer weather, time for a break from our regular routines, the sounds of children playing outside, flowers and vegetables growing in our gardens and crops growing in the fields. 
the abundance of nature, and all that it offers to refresh our spirits. We give thanks for the presence of members of the Indigenous Church. We are grateful to them for the courage they have modeled in asking for what they need to continue their journeys of healing and rediscovery. We remember as well those individuals and families here at Trinity United Church in Listowel and at Atwood United Church and outside this community who are in need of healing and support. May their spirits be lifted. We name them now in a moment of shared silence. We offer now, O oh God, the deep yearnings of our hearts as we pray for those places and situations where we need your guidance and your presence in our lives and in the lives of the larger community. Spirit of our yesterdays, our todays, and our tomorrows, you make all things new. Transform us during this time of transition. May each of us be wise as we consider the ask of the Indigenous Church, an ask that seeks to build a new relationship, a relationship based on mutual respect, shared joy, and better understanding. Today we offer a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer by the Indigenous Church. It will be on our screens. Let us pray together. Great Spirit, our Creator, who is in all places, sacred is your name. May your wisdom guide us. Your will be done in our lives as it is throughout creation. Provide for us today the nourishment we need and forgive us our wrongs as we forgive those who have wronged us. Lead us on the path of understanding and respect and protect us from ignorance and harm. For you are the source of all power, beauty and love from generation to generation, forever and always. Amen. And our final hymn is 639 verses one, three and four, one more step. go forth this day to shine the light of Christ brightly through our everyday living. And wherever we journey this week, let us be a messenger of justice, love, and peace. Let us listen to the voices of others, especially those who are new to our table and our spaces. Let us encourage others with patience. Let us live our lives joyfully. And as we leave this time and place, 
Remember that we are called to bring justice, compassion, and love into this world. And in this task, we are never alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we go out singing. <laughs>